If anyone wants a recommendation from me in terms of science fiction reading, um, then I've got to say pretty much anything by Ted Chiang. Now, Ted Chiang um, became sort of well known recently because one of his stories was adapted to become the science fiction film Arrival. I thought that was a really awesome movie and the story from which it was adapted um, is also amazing. That story uh, is one of the many in this book that I have. Um, it's a collection of Ted Chiang's short stories and I'm going to talk about from this book um, my favourite three and why I love them. First of all, the reason that I love Ted's stories is that whilst they all involve some sort of science fiction, um, futuristic thinking or even just um, mathematical ideas, something sort of sciencey, that's not what the stories are about. Um, that just provides the context and the flow of the story. The stories are all about something much more down to earth, about human emotions, um, human struggles, and what it's like to be people um, facing these bigger questions that are presented to us from science and from advances in technology and, and things like that. The first story I'm going to mention is called Division by Zero. Now this story is presented almost like a mathematical proof in itself. It deals with the nature of mathematics and the nature of certainty. In essence, without trying to give spoilers really, and but to tell you what it's about, uh, the main character is a mathematician and she's a really amazing mathematician but she proves something, she proves that one equals two. And this is something in mathematics um, that actually has a history of people trying to prove this or people trying to think, can you prove this? Because really, whether you can or not um, is the foundation of, of how we use mathematics. So there's a quote in the story, and the quote is from David Hilbert, the mathematician. It says, if mathematical thinking is defective, where are we to find truth and certitude? And that's kind of the essence of the story. If you've managed to prove something um, that shakes the foundation and the underpinning of what you would consider truth and, and what we base our mathematics on, how can you find any sort of meaning in life after that? The main character tackles with that question. She has nightmares where she can't distinguish between life and death because if she can't distinguish between the numbers one and two, how can, how can she think about anything in the same way anymore? That's the setting of the story, but the story is really not about maths as much as I say that. It's about human empathy and love in this context of mathematical truth. There's one more thing I want to mention about this story and it's following a discussion in the author's notes at the end um, about a very beautiful mathematical equation. He says, A proof that mathematics is inconsistent and that all its wondrous beauty was just an illusion would, it seems to me, be one of the worst things you could ever learn. Maybe I sort of agree with that and that's why I like the story so much. The second story that I want to mention is a very short one, but I thought it was really thoughtful. It's called The Evolution of Human Science and it was originally published in the scientific journal Nature and it's kind of funny that it was because it toys with the idea of, well, what is the future of scientific journals in a world um, where humans are no longer at the forefront of science and instead say AI or something else is. I'll read one quote to you that is from the first paragraph of the story. What is the role of human scientists in an age when the frontiers of scientific inquiry have moved beyond the comprehension of humans? So I really liked that. In the story, um, these metahumans communicate their research through like digital neural transfers. So essentially they just communicate with each other. Humans are left out of the loop, but the scientific journals still exist for humans to try and 
decipher what's actually going on in science. They no longer make contributions, it's more of a translation exercise it seems. The story asks the main question, what would our role be? What would the role of a human scientist be? But it's actually rather optimistic. It doesn't say that there would be no need for human scientists. It makes a valid argument that you would still need human scientists if you're still going to have humans because you need someone doing some sort of science that is actually representative of of a group of people that aren't being represented otherwise. It almost seems like the author is tackling the fundamental idea of diversity in science and why you need unique voices because otherwise a certain group of people and their needs will probably get left behind. The last story I'm going to mention to you is the namesake of this book um, and that's the one that became the movie Arrival. It's called The Story of Your Life and essentially if you haven't seen the movie or read the story um, we're dealing with aliens that visit Earth and we're trying to communicate with them but we learn things from the way that they communicate and sort of the ideas that they consider important enough to communicate um, we learn things about uh, linguistics, about um, what's important to us and what might be universally important I really like this story because there's some physics in it um, and there's some really cute diagrams in here too because there is a whole section, this didn't really make it into the film, but there's a whole section in the book about um, Fermat's principle of least time and how that works at a air-water interface. So I'll try and show you some of the diagrams. Um, but we essentially, let's see, we focus. We essentially have air and water and we've got um, light going between them. And this is refraction. So when light gets to say water, it bends. Now the reason it bends is because it tra wants to travel that total distance from A to B in the least time possible. But the least time possible you might think, well wouldn't that just be a straight line? And that's the dotted line in this picture. But that's not the fastest path because in fact if you were to take that dotted line you would be traveling um, for a longer time through the water but water slows down the movement of the light. So actually you want to uh, get to a happy medium where you're traveling a certain distance in the water, a certain distance in air, and the speeds there will come out to give you the shortest path. It's a principle that applies across a lot of areas of physics. Um, it's a variational principle, and I think it's discussed quite well in the book from a classical perspective. This idea has some quantum mechanics underpinnings, and they're not discussed here, but um, from a classical point of view, you can almost look at it, and this is what the author has done, has looked at this principle and it almost seems like light can see the future, it can see its path before it embarks on that path. Um, and that's really the essence of the story here. It's away from this physics and away from the aliens and all this sci-fi sounding stuff. This is a story about someone that knows their fate and has to learn to accept it. It's, I found a really sad story. Oh, like I cried in the movie adaptation of this. I don't know, I just really liked it. It's, it's about um, sort of having your future laid out in front of you and instead of trying to change the bad things, accepting it all as the journey that you're going to take. If you've read any of Ted Chiang's stories, please let me know which ones you liked. And since I've finished this book, I'm on the lookout for some more short stories, hopefully with a science fiction sort of bend, so I'd love to hear some of your recommendations too.